helping you with real estate, Mr. Mike Johnston. Welcome everybody, we're glad that you're here. Today is class number three, and we're dealing with building blocks of real estate. So our handout is available online at professionalrealestateschool.com. You can click there where it says handout for September 8th and get that downloaded. We're gonna be dealing with seller forms. Today we'll also have this be recorded so you can pull it up there and watch it later on if you need to. So keep that in mind. So I'm going to go ahead and switch over here so that we can see some of the forms that we've got. The first thing that we need to deal with would be the agency disclosure brochure. This right here, this document is key. We're required by law to go ahead and pass this particular document out and distribute it to all buyers and sellers. So today where we're dealing with buyer, I mean with sellers, this particular form, at the very last page, we'd put, type in the brokerage name and phone number and we'd have them sign it. Now on this particular document, we're going through it because we're explaining to these sellers that there's customers and clients. Now when we're getting a listing, these people will automatically become a client because a listing agreement is a representation agreement. And it explains what we do with a customer and what we do for a client. Keeping things confidential is one of the biggest things. A couple other things on here to keep in mind would be that we're talking about audio and video surveillance. If for some reason there's a property that has a video camera going at one of our sellers, they should disclose that to potential buyers. Just like when you go to Walmart or something and you see things in the, in the what's it called, the driveway place out there, you can see in the parking lot, they have a sign that says under video surveillance. This way they're informing the people what's there. And that way they can know that they're being recorded. So the same thing, when you have a listing, you need to make sure that the people understand that they could be being recorded. All right. And then it also talks about real estate licensees are not inspectors. So by not being an inspector, we're not the ones that are going to be finding things that are wrong with the home. We might see some things and encourage the seller to correct it and repair it, but we're not gonna be the, an inspector. So that right there would be the first document that we have. And the next page in the handout just talks a little bit about it, has some information there that you can read. So the handout really does some great stuff there. Lead-based paint. Sometimes the homes may have lead-based paint in them. And if they do, we're required to have this document be signed and acknowledged by all parties. The law says, and this is a federal law, that this must be disclosed to the buyer prior to writing up a contract. If our office gets audited and they look at these contracts and it was done afterwards, it could be a $10,000 fine. So it's very important that these are filled out on any property that was built prior to 1978. Now how this is filled out, you put the address of the property right here, then the seller will mark either one or two, that says they know of lead-based paint or that they don't know of any lead-based paint. Then the BU talks about records that they have. If they have any that they'll provide to the sellers, to the buyers, or if they don't have any, then they'd mark that next part. The purchasers would fill this part out and we'll talk about that tomorrow on the buying forms. And then the agent that's working with the seller will initial here. So if you're the agent working with the seller, you'll initial this particular page. Some of the older forms had two little blanks there and the agent working with the buyers, many times they'd initial it. And I'd always ask the agent, did you really talk to the seller? And they said, no. Then I said, why did you initial that you did? So it's only for the person or the agent working with the seller. Then at the bottom, the seller would sign it and the agent working with the seller would also sign and date this. So here's some information from the EPA that talks a little bit more about that form. So I've got the information there for you, but I'm not gonna go through all of that right here. Seller's property condition disclosure form. In Idaho, it's the law that the seller must disclose anything that they know about the property and make some disclosures with that. So with that being said, the Idaho Association of Realtors has put together this disclosure document that permits the seller to fill it out and they're now informed 
more about the property. Now the law says that there's only about eight things that are required to be disclosed. However, the Idaho Association of Realtors has put this together and it's a lot larger because it will help kind of jog the memory of the seller a little bit more about the property, ask other questions. So it's very wise that we can get this filled out. And so we'd put the seller's names, the date, and the address on the top. Now the first three questions. Is the property located in an area of city impact, adjacent or contiguous to a city limit, and thus legally subject to annexation by the city? The choices that the people have are yes, no, do not know, or the property is already within the city limits. So typically they'll mark that it's already within the city limits. So that's a simple one to do. But why do they ask that question? Well, let me read the second question and the third one, and we'll discuss all three of them. Does the property, if not within the city limits, receive any city services, thus making it legally subject to annexation by the city? The third one says, does the property have a written consent to annex recorded in the county recorder's office, thus making it legally subject to annexation by the city? So with that in mind, taxes are a big issue for people. So right now, if you're talking about how much the taxes are, and then you sell the property and it gets annexed and their taxes go up or double because now they're inside a city, they felt that that should be disclosed. So by disclosing this, it means that, hey, right now the taxes are lower, but you could become part of the city and be annexed in. And if that's the case, your taxes may go up. So that's why that part of the disclosure is so important. Continuing on, it says the purpose of this statement is being made by the seller and it's not a guarantee, it's not a warranty, it's just stating pretty much the condition of the property right now as of this date. Now if there's any changes to this property, something happens between the date this was filled out and closing, we might want to have our sellers fill out a new property disclosure form or if it's something simple they could amend this one and make changes to it. If there's ever anything big and you still don't have an offer on the property yet, let's say we're not dealing with such a hot market that we have right now, I would have the sellers fill out a brand new one as of a different date and have that disclosure be made. But if you already have an offer on the property and there's a change, have them disclose it as an addendum to here or at the very bottom of the form. And we'll go through that a little bit when we get to the bottom of the page. Okay. Here are some of the questions that are asked. And I'm not gonna go through all of the questions, I'll just mention some of them so that you can know what we're asking the people. Now this is filled out by the sellers. They fill it out. They're supposed to make the disclosure. We should not coach them or say certain things, but they're, they're gonna ask us some questions and we can go ahead and answer those. But I'd like to say when in doubt, fill it out, spell it out, put all the information there. If they say, well, this happened, I don't know, should I put that down? hey, it wouldn't hurt, let's go ahead and put it down. It's better to have somebody have some knowledge about a problem that happened in the past and then you can explain how you corrected it versus somebody coming into the house and seeing some little watermarks along the, the bottom of the basement uh, and they say, well, what else are they hiding? They didn't disclose this to us. So it's better to disclose more than less in my opinion. The first one says built-in vacuum system. Well, the choices here are none, not included, working, not working, do not know, or see remarks. So if the home does not have a built-in vacuum system, you'd mark none or not included, that first one. The next one says clothes dryer. Well, a lot of times you'll have your sellers mark working. Well, I like to sit right next to them on the first couple of questions as I go through it with them and say, and they're about to sign working or mark working, but then I say, you were planning to take that with you, weren't you? Oh yeah. So that means it would be none, not included, because it's gonna be not included with the sale. Now the Idaho Association of Realtors has made some changes to the forms, the purchase and sell agreement, et cetera. And this particular document, even though somebody might mark it that it's included or working, let's say, the purchase and sell agreement is protecting the seller that says that sometimes there's things that are marked that may or may not be included. So that kind of helps us out because some people in the past have said, well, it was, on the it was on the property disclosure form, so it must be included. The next one is a clothes washer. 
dishwasher, disposal, refrigerator, kitchen vent fan, hood, microwave oven, oven range, cooktops, trash compactor, security system, garage door openers and controls, light fixtures, smoke detectors, fire alarm, carbon monoxide detectors. Then we have our seller's initial and date the bottom of the page. Now off on the right, if they have anything that they want to add, let them write things down. That's fine. Okay, page two. Attic fan, central air conditioners, room air conditioners, evaporative coolers, fireplace, fireplace inserts, heating systems, humidifiers, pellet stoves, wood stoves, air cleaners. Then it says fuel tank section. A lot of homes don't have a fuel tank anymore, but some of the older homes had an oil tank. Sometimes you might have a propane tank outside for some of the homes. So this is what you, where you're dealing with that. Moisture draining drainage conditions, if it's in a floodplain, if they know about that. And it goes through additional questions here. So they'll initial that and date it. Then the very last page, there's two spots here for seller's signatures, but the first one is where we want them to sign because they sign and date that there, and then the buyers will sign and date that. With Instanet or Form Simplicity, sometimes you might have it so it has the seller sign the bottom part, remove that because this is if there's any amendments or a, something's changed, because if so, they could write it here and then the seller would sign that and give it to the buyer again. We've had attorneys that say that something has changed in between the time that it was first disclosed and it closed. And we have signatures that show certain things, but they say, oh, you failed there, your seller failed to disclose this other activity that happened. So if there's a change, we wanna make sure that we have it written down. Now, if this document's not big enough, they could fill out a whole nother property disclosure form and we could give that to the buyers. Or if you need to attach some documents to this, you can do so. And we just have to reference that and have everybody initial and date that. So there's ways to make sure that we're letting all the parties see everything that needs to be disclosed. And that would be the seller's property disclosure form here. Now, you may be asking, saying, oh, I remember a form that's an exempt form that people don't need to fill out the property disclosure form. Well, that's true, there is one. However, we've seen a lawsuit at our own office where an agent made a recommendation that the people were exempt and they weren't exempt. And because of that, the agent and the office had to defend the lawsuit because we were the ones that made that recommendation. So right now, we recommend as an office just to give out this particular disclosure, the seller's property disclosure form and have the seller fill that out completely. If they don't know, they can put down they don't know. We've had people say, well, my people that have this property used it as a rental. They never lived in it before. They're not exempt because they didn't live in it. No, they owned it. They possibly repaired a roof as the property owners. It was a rental and they fixed a roof. Maybe there's a water leak that they know about so they could disclose that. They might not know all of the answers to the questions, but they'll know for certain things that they paid or had remodeled or fixed so they can make those disclosures. If you ever get a property disclosure that comes back to you that says, uh, never lived in the property and that's it. I would ask that seller or the agent to have the seller fill out another one and make a better disclosure than that okay so keep that in mind moving on to the next document compensation agreement with the seller there are times when you might want to have be protected to receive compensation from the seller and not have a listing that could be with a builder it could be a for sale by owner it could actually be when you're showing properties across the state let's say i don't know why you want to do that but let's say you did and you're not part of that MLS or you're not part of that entity that would guarantee compensation to you. So if you're not part of that entity, then you'd want to be compensated by the seller. And you could present this document beforehand, before presenting the offer that says in this case, this particular buyer for this property, whatever, that you would be compensated and protected for the work that you've done. Now we don't do things for free. I've had people ask me before, well, if I'm doing something and I'm just helping out. Well, you're helping out and you're utilizing your license to help somebody out to buy or sell real estate. So it has to run through the office and you have to make the right disclosures. You have to do everything right. You can't just say I'm helping out a little bit 
because you're using your license and it's regulated in the state of Idaho. So on this, you put the date, your name is the agent, seller's names, the legal description right here. Then there's a time frame. It says that it, agree, it will start on such and such a time and end on such and such a time. So you need to have the term of this compensation agreement. The brokerage fee payable to, and that's where you put the company name, Keller Williams Realty East Idaho, because all compensation must go through your broker. Then we talk about how much it will be. It could be a brokerage fee of X percent. Back in the day, when you took a, a build job to a builder, typically you could still ask for seven or six percent when you did a build job with a builder. Nowadays, it's more customary to be probably around uh, well, negotiable, of course, but probably around 3% is what you can negotiate. Or it could be a flat fee that you could put in here as well. Then the second one is if you're dealing with the lease. So if you're going to do some property management or help a business property be leased out, you could use this and it shows compensation for you with that. Additional items or terms. Here you could put down for this particular buyer only. If you wanted to put something down there, that way the seller, if it's a four subway owner, doesn't feel that any person that you bring, they'd be required to. But sometimes it'd be okay to leave that open. But you could tie it down to just one particular party here. Then you'd have everybody sign that, you as the agent on behalf of the broker. And then you'd have this and submit that as well. So that's the main parts of that particular form. And here's some explanation and some more details for you with that. Then we'll talk now about the seller representation agreement, the exclusive right to represent. Now in Idaho, there's more than one type of listing that you can have. Who remembers those different choices? Well, we have exclusive agency, exclusive right to sell, and we have, uh, a, there, there's also a net listing that could be done. There's an open listing, so there's different things here. Now, each MLS is different of what they permit, but most of them will permit an exclusive right to sell, an exclusive agency, and sometimes exclusive uh, right to sell with prospects or things along those lines. But a net listing, typically no. And open listings, sometimes they'll permit that. Uh, but the exclusive agency, they would permit. Now, this right here on the very top of the form, it says that it's an exclusive right to represent. What that means is no matter who brings in a buyer to this particular seller, the seller is obligated to compensate you and the brokerage firm that you work with a, a commission. Now you might be thinking, well, how about with a builder? You know, what if they're doing something? Well, technically with a builder, it would be an exclusive agency listing that you would want to have if they're going to retain the right to sell things themselves. However, most real estate offices use this same form when they list it, but they have that understanding with that builder that they can release them or not charge a fee for a listing if the builder reserves the right to sell it themselves. But in the fine print, an exclusive right to sell listing means no matter who sells it that they would be compensating the brokerage firm. Okay, so on here we'd have the date, the agent, the seller's name retains, and here's where you put the broker's name, the broker of, and the company name. Now, I think it's important to read this first paragraph. Same thing on the buyer representation agreement. On any of these representation agreements, I think you should read this paragraph to the people. Why? Because it explains a few things here that I think that they need to understand because people say, oh, I thought I could sell it myself or something. So let's go ahead and read this. I'm going to expand this a little bit more so I can have it be a little wider on the screen. Okay. It says, the seller retains Michael James Johnston, broker of Keller Williams Realty East Idaho, as the seller's exclusive broker to sell, lease, or exchange the property described below. Hereafter, property. On the terms stated herein, or on other terms agreed to in writing by the seller in future negotiations with any buyer. The seller retains the broker and grants the broker the exclusive right to represent the seller. 
where the seller is represented by only one broker for the duration stated herein and for the express purpose of representing the seller in the sale, lease, or exchange of the property. Further, seller agrees, warrants, and acknowledges that the seller has not and shall not enter into any seller representation agreement with another broker to sell, lease, or exchange the property during the effective term of this agreement. Seller agrees to indemnify and hold the above listed broker harmless from any claim brought by any other broker or real estate salesperson for compensation claimed for assisting the seller during the duration of this agreement. By appointing the broker as the seller's exclusive real estate broker, seller agrees to conduct all negotiations to sell the property through the broker and to refer to broker all inquiries or leads received in any form from real estate brokers, salespersons, prospective buyers, or any other source during the time this exclusive seller representation agreement is in effect. So what does that mean? If you have it listed, you are the one that they should send everything to and you are responsible to assist them in all negotiations, to assist them to be able to get things done, to answer the questions, etc. So make sure you're doing what you're supposed to do. So many people don't understand that. They say, oh, well, if I'm going to leave my for sale by owner sign up in my yard and if they come to me and they call me because of that, then I'm not going to pay a fee. Well, this document says no matter where it comes from, it's going to be this. Now, you could put in other terms and conditions and make some modifications. Yes, but without that, this is what we're going with, okay? Property address and or legal description. So here we put down the address, commonly known as 123 North Main Street, Bonneville County, Idaho Falls, Idaho, zip code. And it always makes me wonder why on here they don't put Idaho down. On some of the forms they do, but here they don't. We can only list properties in Idaho. So this default here should be Idaho. Legal and or property description. We can put the legal here. If it's a longer legal, you can mark legal to be attached as an exhibit, A, for example. Now, Legal descriptions. There are many people that put down more than they need to put down. In fact, I saw one just, uh, boy, I think it was today. No, maybe it was yesterday where they had put down the section, township, range, and all that other type of stuff. That's not necessary. When you have a recorded plat in a subdivision and it's all done and it's in a, a subdivision in a county, you can stop at the end of the listing of that subdivision. So lot three, block two, Caribou Meadows Estates second division. And then that would be your legal because then it says county, state, etc. Sometimes people will take from the county assessor's office or the tax rolls, it says 0.13 acres of this. Well, that's not a legal description. That's not enforceable. I'd like to see you draw off on a piece of paper the 0.13 acre of that lot. It's not clear. So that's why it's not accurate. Or it might say 4,326 4, square feet of. Well, whenever you see the 0.16 acre or the square footage, that's usually used by the assessor's office so they know how much land you have to charge taxes on. So a legal description will say lot and block in a subdivision, or it could be a long legal with meets and bounds where it starts at one point and it goes around to another point and bounces around until it gets back to the point of beginning. So when you order a profile or a property, a property profile from a title company, they'll typically give you the last recorded deed on the property. And when they do that, that shows you the legal description there and you can verify that. So don't always look at the tax records or the tax sheet that comes from the title company. I've had people argue with me right and left that says, I copied it down just like what I got from the title company. I said, okay, I understand that, but it could, could be wrong. Did you look at the deed? Uh, no, I didn't. Well, always look there so you can verify it. And it's important that when we get something from the title company, many times if it's a larger parcel or it's not just a lot and block, they'll have a picture that shows what it is that is part of that legal description. Always verify that with your seller so we can make sure that we know what it is that we're selling and what's going to be transferred. 
I've had some times when we have a legal description that's multiple legal descriptions and the seller says, oh no, I don't wanna sell that part off. I'm just selling this part off. So you don't wanna to transfer too much, but then again, you don't wanna transfer not all of it. There might be an extra legal description that needs to be attached. So please review that. Okay. Now, if you're going to attach an exhibit for a legal description and you get that, that uh, property profile and it has the, the legal description on it, on that warranty deed, you can put a piece of paper over the top, a piece of paper over the bottom part so you don't have to recopy it and possibly make a mistake. And you could basically say, Exhibit A, uh, the legal description for the property at such and such an address, and then have a spot for everybody to initial and date it at the bottom. Term of the agreement. The term of this agreement shall commence on such and such a date and shall expire at 11.59 p.m. on such and such a date, unless renewed or extended. If the seller accepts an offer to purchase or exchange, the terms of this agreement shall be extended through the closing of the transaction. So that's what the attorneys have put up, is saying that we can go ahead and have this kind of an extension there in the event that we need to continue on with the property or continue on and not have to get an extension of our listing. So that can work out there. But if you're doing a market analysis right now and you find out the days on the market are 90 days or 100 days, I'm just using that for an example, not saying that that's what's happening today. Would you wanna take a listing for 60 days if the average days on the market is higher than that? No. So sometimes you'll have a seller that wants you to list the property for a shorter period of time and they'll say, hey, we can always extend it. Well, that's true, but many times it's easier to have a listing with a long, longer time frame now versus having to go back and talk to the seller to negotiate or try to get something to happen if the property hasn't sold. So I'd recommend that you get like a six month listing, put it down for something like that in a common market. Land, commercial properties, many times can be longer, it could be a year for a listing. So keep things in mind when you're negotiating or putting things down. Sometimes if you have things filled out on the form already, people don't question it as much because that's what you've already put down. But if you're filling it out in front of them, many times they'll want to negotiate or change things to be in a better situation for them. This has to work out for them and for you. The price. Here you can fill that out. Sometimes I'll go to the property with everything ready to go except for the price. And if that's the case, you can always write in the price here because no one signed the document yet, so it's still the original document. When in doubt, you could have somebody initial and date that, that it's there, but if it's before anyone has signed it, you're okay. It hasn't changed the original document yet. Financing. Here's where you can mark down the different types of financing that the seller will accept on the property. FHA, VA, Conventional, Idaho Housing and Finance Association, Rural Development, Exchange, Cash, Conventional to Existing Loans, Assumption of Existing Loans, and even the seller will carry a contract and accept a minimum down payment of X number of dollars, and it can put down the criteria of what they're willing to do. Now this is where you're getting permission from the seller to market the property in different ways. If they agree here to have an FHA loan or VA loan, many times there might be some fees or other charges that may be required for the seller to participate in. If they're willing to do a contract, you can put down some of the terms here. But remember, we can't wrap a loan. They're, they're forbidden pretty much nowadays. Most of them are not assumable. If they are, you can put down that it's an assumable loan, but most of them are not. And if that's the case, you can't be making the payment to the seller and the seller keeps it in their name, then they make that payment on, et cetera, because that can be considered fraudulent. So if anyone says, oh, I'll carry a contract on the property, we have to find out for sure, can they legally do so? And sometimes on the existing loans, there might be a due on sell clause that's there or there could be an acceleration clause because sometimes when these sellers are selling their property, the loan that they had, they got a great interest rate or something and there's a time frame that they can't sell the property yet. So always check that part out here. So if you mark these things here, that's what you can also mark on the MLS data sheet so they can also 
on the MLS so they know what type of financing they're willing to accept. Brokerage fee. Here, we put down the brokerage fee. Does anybody know what the company policy is for the brokerage fee? Seeing no one jumping up and down to tell me, the company policy is anything between zero and 30,000 for our list price would be a 10% brokerage fee. Between the 30,000 and 100,000 is a 7% brokerage fee. Over 100,000, we charge a 6% brokerage fee. Why is that? All fees are negotiable. If we said, oh, we're the same as Remax. Oh, we're the same as Century 21. Oh, it's fixed. That's against the law. Price fixing, etc. So our office has this policy. Granted, all things are negotiable. We can modify it. But by having that policy, it sets us apart that we know that we have a different amount that we are charging or are supposed to charge when we list property. Okay, so keep that in mind. I had one agent in Pocatello that always discounted her commission. So as the broker, I told her she could no longer do that. And she was able to get the amount that we charge as an office on commissions. And she, because she was not making a whole lot of money when she discounted her commission so much every single time. That she sold a lot of property and she still does, but she wasn't getting the income that she needed to make. She couldn't run her business on 1% that she got. So keep things there. All right, so back to the document. Now we put down the total amount here of how much we're going to charge. So let's say it's over 100,000, so we're gonna charge them 6%. We could put a flat dollar figure here. Now, have you ever listed a manufactured home for $5,000 or $10,000? That's why it's not a 6% brokerage fee. $600 for something like that, you're doing a lot of work and you're splitting that in half, so that's 300 each. If there was a lawsuit, you're gonna get charged a whole lot more than that $300. And that 300, maybe you still are on a split with a brokerage firm and other expenses coming out of that. So that's why we have it be a larger amount for things that are less. Also, you might have it be a flat fee on a manufactured home. You might charge $2,500 if it's a lower priced unit or something. So keep that in mind as well. So here we disclose how much we're receiving and it says of this total brokerage fee, blank percent is what we're going to share with the competing or cooperating brokerage firm. So here we have authorization and we're showing how much we're going to be sharing. You may have recalled last year, there's a lot of things going on in the nation talking about, oh, all these real estate agents, they're not sharing the commission, they're not disclosing who gets what. Our forms have it. We disclose what we're sharing to the seller. They know what they're paying to the person bringing in the buyer. So it's up front. B talks about leasing. I'm not gonna do that today and C, uh, it talks about, let me just read it. If the brokerage fee is payable, the brokerage fee is payable if the property or any portion thereof or interest therein is directly or indirectly sold, exchanged, or optioned, or agreed to be sold, exchanged, or optioned within blank 90 calendar days following the expiration of the term hereof to any person who has examined, been introduced to, or been shown the property during the term hereof. Unless the seller enters into a seller representation agreement to market the said property with another broker, this subsection, C, shall survive the term or termination of this agreement unless explicit, explicitly revoked in a written document signed by broker and client. So what that particular thing means is, let's say that we have a contract that's signed and then the listing expires. So we have this, this party here, we've done all the work and then now they wanna write up an offer on it. Well, we're protected. We can write up that offer after it's expired and still be compensated. However, it says if the property or the seller relists the property with an exclusive right to sell contract with another broker, then there's no more compensation that's being promised or offered to us during that 90 days, if that's what we're talking about. So that's why many times when we have something pending, the brokerage firm will say, please, get this listing extended because it will protect us. It'll protect you as the agent to be compensated. 
let's say that the agent wanted the seller wanted to be a little picky on stuff so they might uh, go ahead and accept an offer three days later and then relist it with somebody uh, discount brokerage or somebody else for one percent or one dollar and then that's all that they're gonna have to compensate if they're trying to play around with something like that so please make sure that you are informed additional fees paragraph number seven here is where if someone's charging a transaction fee or other fees they may put that here and charge that and disclose that to the seller included items all the different items that are supposed to be included in the property are written here it says that they'll leave all the seller owned attached floor coverings so they can't take out the carpet television wall mounts so if they have those things connected to the wall those stay they can take the TV but the wall mount hooked to the wall should stay satellite dish attached plumbing bathroom and lighting fixtures window screens screen doors storm doors storm windows window coverings garage door openers and transmitters exterior trees plants or shrubbery water heating apparatus and fixtures attached fireplace equipment awnings ventilating cooling and heating systems all ranges ovens built-in dishwashers fuel tanks and irrigation fixtures and equipment if any that are pertinent thereto that are now on or used in connection with the premises and shall be included in the cell unless otherwise provided herein so how about the drapes the mini blinds are they included according to this they are so if it matches the little kid's bed in the one room you need to make sure that you exclude that on the purchase and sell agreement that you'll put down that that's excluded I'd also disclose it that that's excluded in the purchase in the listing agreement so that you can make sure that the agent when they write up an offer puts that down but if not your job is to protect your seller and have that be written down of what's to be excluded now here it also talked about uh, ranges it says all ranges so if you have a, an oven slash range that's plugs in or it's gas and it's there it's considered included unless you specifically exclude it so if I didn't write it down under the included items and I didn't write it down under the excluded items does it stay according to this contract it does it's already included but so many people want to write it out again just to make sure and so that's fine you can write down range slash oven again under the included items even though it says in the contract in the fine print that it stays excluded items write down things that are gonna be removed when in doubt spell it out if there's a shed in the backyard and your sellers planning to take it make sure that you write it down that it's going to be removed and you negotiate that and put that down in the purchase and sell agreement just because it's on this listing agreement doesn't necessarily mean that that's going to actually be gone for example when I'm listing this property I'm listing it for 200,000 right but an offer comes in at 195 and I accept it does that mean the seller can hold me to the contract saying oh I had it in writing that it's not supposed to stay or I'm supposed to get that 200,000 no this is in an ideal world we have everything down so when we're talking about appliances yes they have a very good argument saying I told my agent that I was going to exclude that water softener I was going to exclude that such and such so it's our job to know what's going on and when that offer comes in we say hey mr. And mrs. seller remember when we listed the property you wanted to take that with you you didn't want to leave it here but they're asking for it is it okay that you leave it here to keep the deal together because that's what they want or should we counter back and exclude it okay so that's key farms crops timber rights etc so it talks about that you don't have to deal with this a whole lot but let's say that you're dealing with a farm property unless you specifically come to some type of an agreement whoever's farming that land has the right to come back at harvest time to get it but who's paying for the water who's paying for all these other things during that time frame well you have to address that type of stuff too but just be cautious water and mineral rights title and existing encumbrances 
Now back to water and mineral rights. Yesterday, well, this past weekend, I dealt with some sellers that had given their mineral rights underneath their home to a now defunct company. And they asked me, does that mean that we get it back? Well, you have to double check, but once you give something away, you typically don't get it back. So if I've given the subsurface rights away, so when I'm marketing the property and you know it's gone, you probably should disclose that to future buyers that it's been gone, okay? Because you can't transfer something that you don't have. Title and existing encumbrances. Here it says that the seller is going to transfer the property by a warranty deed. Now, if you list a property for a, a relocation company or it's been foreclosed on, they typically will not do a warranty deed. So you may need to modify this if you find out that it's going to be sold or transferred a different way. Many times the addendums that the per, to the purchase and sell agreement that those relocation companies require to be attached change it and say that it's going to be a special warranty deed or something else. So just keep that in mind as well. Seller agrees to provide good and marketable title to the property at the time of closing. The property is currently encumbered by the following liens. None, first mortgage, second mortgage, home equity loan or other. When you pull and get that property disclose, property um, profile, they'll typically show you the last recorded deed. Sometimes they'll show you that there's two and they might do that there, but always ask the seller, do you have any other loans on the property? Because you wanna make sure you have everything accounted for. Because if they're tight on funds or something and there's another lien on there that they weren't thinking about and it has to be paid off, and they might not have as much money coming from that as they were thinking. Back in the day, this is probably about 10 years ago or so, when, or maybe a little bit more when we were having some problems, people didn't really know that they had a, they might not have known that they had certain liens against their property, where they refinanced their home and took 110% out. So they owed more on it than, the, than it was worth. Well, at times like that, many times the people are going to say, oh, well, you discount your brokerage fee or cut that because I'm not getting anything. Most of the time, the people, the sellers, have already taken their equity out, and it's not our fault for them doing that. Possibly they refinanced and put their boat or jet ski or some consumer debt against their home where they can tax it, use it for a tax deduction because they're paying interest on the property. So it's not always our responsibility to discount our brokerage fee or do something else because somebody else had already tied it into their property. Okay, so be cautious with that. If you ever have questions, please let me know. If encumbered, the loan payments are current, yes or no? If no, then they ask, is the property currently or is it not currently under foreclosure proceedings? If it is being foreclosed upon, come talk to me so we can find out if there's enough time for you to get the home marketed and sold. If not, it may not be worth it to go ahead and try to help market the property because there's only so many things that you can do. And if it is, we're required to have another disclosure document to provide to all buyers. So come talk to me if that happens as well. Moving on to the next page, page three of five. And on all these pages, we have them initial the bottom of the page and put the property address on the top and the ID number, et cetera. Multiple listing service. Depending on where the property is located, you want to make sure that it's in the right multiple listing service. For example, if you're getting a listing in Pocatello, you're not gonna want to put it in the Snake River MLS only because everyone in Pocatello doesn't have access to that. You're not doing the best job for your sellers. Conversely, let's say that you're in Pocatello and you put a property from Idaho Falls in that MLS. Same thing, it's not going to help your people. So you have to disclose to the people, hey, I'm not a member of that multiple listing service if they still really want you to market it. It may not be to their best interest. But how about a property in Blackfoot? 
Blackfoot is part of the, their association is part of the Snake River Multiple Listing Service. However, a lot of people from Pocatello still show properties in Blackfoot. So it may be advantageous to have more than one MLS to have it entered into. So on this particular form, you can put down the Greater Pocatello Association of Realtors MLS and slash or the Snake River Regional Multiple Listing Service. That way it shows that you have permission to do it, but it's up to your discretion because it says and or in case you forgot to put it into one of those, okay? And then you'd have them initial to the side of that that gives you that permission. Lockbox authorization, same thing. If you don't have permission to have a lockbox on the property, you better not put one on there. So it needs to be initialed. AVM and blogging authorization. I have a brochure that I could share with you that talks about what AVM is, explains it a little bit more. Not everybody understands it. If you'd like it, send me an email and just say, hey, Mike, send me a copy of that AVM, the automated valuation model brochure. It's Do you mind the... sending one to me and I can send it to all the newer agents? Sure, because that way it can be explained better. It's put out by the National Association of Realtors and it explains it. It was gonna be something pretty big, so they put it on most of the forms, but it really hasn't become anything big, so many times people don't know what to mark on that. Advertising authorization. There's several questions here that you can mark does or does not for the seller agreeing to allow. The first one is to in display on the internet, listing documents, price, etc. Second one, address to be displayed on the internet. The third one being permitting us to market it in print media. The fourth, any other type of advertising media. And then the very last one, putting a sign on the property. Then up above, I kind of mess, skip that one that talks about blogging or other consumer comments, locations. 17, seller's property disclosure form. Like I mentioned earlier, we're required to have the seller fill out a disclosure document. So give them the full one and ask them to fill that out. If there's a comment on there that they don't know, they can mark, do not know. Lead-based paint disclosure. Here is where staff and the office looks because we're not able to pull up the address and the date on every single property as it's entered into or the documents come to us. So if it here it shows that it is target housing, then we're going to ask you as the listing agent to have the lead disclosure, the lead-based paint disclosure document. Okay, so if for some reason you wonder why staff asks you for that and it's a 1990 home, well, look back on your listing because if your listing had it marked here as it is, we didn't know it was a 1990 home. So we're asking you because here it shows that it needs to have one. But just the opposite. Maybe you mark that it doesn't and then we find out that it does. You're still going to need to have that to protect your seller so they don't get fined and we don't get fined that $10,000 from the EPA. 19, transaction related service disclaimer. This was added into the buyer representation agreement as well as into the listing agreement, seller rep, because there were sellers or buyers that felt that we made a recommendation to say, oh, use ABC plumbing or use this person or that person. And they felt and had lawsuits that that was the only company that they could use. So this brings up the discussion where we say, we might make a recommendation to you However, that's not the only entity you can use. You can choose whoever you want. You're asking for our advice. We're going to give you that advice and our opinion, but you can still choose whoever you want. So that's why many of these documents start to become bigger and bigger because we have to have all these disclaimers to protect us as licensees from possible lawsuits from the other party. Number 20 talks about consent to limited dual consent to limited dual representation and assigned agency, as well as the next paragraph, 21 seller no notification and consent to release from conflicting agency duties. So here we're able to talk about representation, how that works out, and they would initial either the top one or the bottom. Now in many of the forms company programs that are out there, it shows both of them would be selected or able. Well, they did that on purpose. You go in and you delete the one that you don't want. So if it's going to be a limited dual agency and or assigned agency, then you would go in and you delete the marks on the single agency before you send it out for electronic signatures. That way they're not initialing both. So it's set up that way for you. 
However, make sure you discuss and explain what those differences are. That way they'll be agreeing to the right thing. 22, other potential sellers and buyers. Seller understands that other potential buyers may consider, make offers on, or purchase through the broker the same or similar properties a seller is seeking to sell. Seller also understands that other potential sellers may consider, receive offers on, or sell through broker the same or similar properties as the seller is seeking to sell. Seller consents to broker's representation of such other potential buyers and sellers before, during, and after the expiration of this agreement and further releases the broker of any conflicting agency duties that may arise through said representation. Why is that important? Well, as we understand with agency, we owe the utmost responsibility to our client. Can you have more than one client? Yes. How do you know which one you're supposed to put in front of the other? That's where this paragraph comes in, so we can discuss that. There may be a time that your neighbor lists their home right next door to you, and it's exactly the same, the colors, everything. Well, are you gonna put one above the other? You really can't. You're just gonna offer them, market them. The buyers will come in and the buyers will choose. So that right there should help us. 23, information warranty. Seller warrants that all information provided by the seller is true and correct. Deposit. Brokers are authorized to receive a deposit from any prospective purchaser who offers to purchase or exchange the property and shall notify the seller of receipt of any such deposit. Cost reimbursements. If the buyer defaults in performance of any purchase and sell agreement procured under this agreement and seller becomes entitled to the earnest money, now listen to this. This is the part that people don't understand. It says that, and the seller becomes entitled to the earnest money, the holder of the earnest money shall pay out of the earnest money the costs incurred by the seller's broker related to the transaction, including, without limitation, title insurance, escrow fees, appraisal, credit report fees, inspection fees, attorney's fees. If the seller elects to accept the earnest money as liquidated damages, so if we have a, a termination agreement and it's signed that it's going to come back to the seller, the holder of the earnest money shall first pay from the earnest money the aforementioned costs incurred by the seller's broker and then pay any balance of the earnest money, one half to the seller and one half to the seller's broker, provided the amount to be paid to the seller's broker shall not exceed the broker's agreed to commission. In the event the seller defaults under any purchase and sell agreement procured under this agreement, seller shall be liable to the broker for any costs incurred by the seller's broker related to this agreement. We don't always enforce that. We don't always say we're gonna split that earnest money half with the brokerage firm and half there. I have seen it happen. It has happened as recently as a couple months ago. So it does happen. But most of the time, we as the agents feel that we should give that back to the seller. But when you're listing the property, this is what it says. So keep that in mind. Earnest money dispute interpolator. If there is a dispute, and we have $500 of earnest money, and they want to have it be interpleaded. An interpleader goes through, and what happens is all the parties to the transaction would be notified. So if you have a buyer, a buyer, their agent, and a broker, then you have the seller, the other seller, their agent, and a broker. There's possibly eight people that are gonna get notified. Now, these eight different people get to plead their case. They write down why they think who should get it, whether it's them or it's the other party, and why. Then all this information is gathered and it's taken to the court and the court decides, based on all those findings of fact that they come up with, who should get the earnest money. Now there's a cost. In here it says that those costs will come out of the earnest money. Well, I just showed you eight people that are gonna get served and there's still an attorney that's gonna have some work that they're doing too. So that's $100 approximately on each of those. So that's $800 and you only had 500 earnest money. Who's paying that difference? Whoever, char whoever filed it is gonna pay that difference and there's nothing to be dispersed. If you have $1,000 earnest money and there's 800 that's already gone, the court only has $200 to say, oh, give it all to the buyer, all to the seller or split it. So what I've done is I typically will say it's gonna be better in the long run to just split the earnest money, 500, 500 if it's 1,000, 
versus possibly only getting $200 back where you could get zero or 100 or get the whole thing of 200. So be cautious with that. Then we get to page five, general provisions. It talks about in the event either party shall initiate a suit against the other, that all parties take care of their own expenses, but the prevailing party could charge the other party for fees. There's the disclaimer for wire transfer warning, non-discrimination, singular and plural, transmission of documents, merger and time is of the essence, severability. That's if the courts determine that one of these paragraphs is not valid or enforceable, they can remove it, sever it, take it out, but the rest of the contract would still be valid. It says brokers are required to present all written offers up until the time of closing. Communication, failure of the seller to reasonably maintain communication with the broker is a breach of this agreement. Other terms and conditions, you can put something down here in the event that there's an excluded person. Fred and Nancy Smith are excluded from this property and in the event that they write up an offer prior to 5 p.m. on such and such a date, then the commission is this. You know, there's other things that can be written. If you want to modify something, please let me know and I'll assist you. Then everybody signs that particular page. And go through the pages that I have submitted to you as well on the purchase in the handout. So the handout's available at professionalrealestateschool.com and it's a 26 or so page document that explains each one of the blanks on the pages. A little, possibly even more so than I went through right now. So you can download that, take a look at it and it should assist you. But that pretty much comes down to the documents that you need to address when you're getting a listing. So if you have any further questions, please feel free to give me a call and reach out to me. Again, you can go online to professionalrealestateschool.com and you'll have links to these classes. There'll also be a link to the, um, my uh, YouTube channel where you can download and see some of the other documents or questions that are asked. And in the next few weeks, we're gonna be going through how to send referrals, how to do different things as well, how to terminate a, an agreement the right way, how to add somebody to a contract. So there's a lot of other things that we'll be going through. But tomorrow, plan on attending, we'll be talking about buyer's documents and the RE21, the purchase and sell agreement.